Hello everyone, my name is Laurent Bernay um, and I'm here with Eric. And I mean, we're very happy to be here today. It's our first uh, KubeCon in person since 2019 in North America. So that's, that's great to, to be here with you. So today we're going to, to discuss our migration of uh, the way we build container images to Kubernetes. And as you, you will see, it was uh, a bit eventful and, and it got pretty interesting. So before we start, we both work for Datadog. Um, so we have a few numbers on, of, uh, about Datadog on the left-hand side of the slide. Um, what, what matters is we, we are an observability company and, and we do a lot of things in the observability space. But today we're not going to talk about Datadog the product, we're going to talk about Datadog's infrastructure because we both work uh, on the Datadog infrastructure teams. So we mm, uh, essentially work on the Kubernetes environment, which is why we're going to talk about building containers in Kubernetes. And as you can see with the numbers, I mean, we have tens of thousands of nodes, dozens of clusters, and, and, and with this come a lot of challenges around many things, but in particular building container images. So before we dive into an uh, interesting issue, let's do a quick overview of how we build things at Datadog. So quite a while back, I'd say it's like up to four or five years ago, we were using this very simple setup to build our applications. So we had GitLab runners pulling a job from GitLab and using Docker machine to provision AWS instances and running a job on them. So pretty standard, pretty simple. When we started our migration to Kubernetes, we needed to, in addition to building applications, we also needed to build container images. And if you're familiar with the way we build Docker images, it usually means having access to the Docker daemon, which basically means being root on the instance where, where you run. So that's why we couldn't reuse the runners we were using for applications, because these runners were reused, and there was no way we could run a workload which would end up being root on the machine because it was running Docker commands. So we ended up having uh, other runners, which were just standalone machines running Docker, doing one job, and when the job was done, uh, they were just being killed and replaced by new ones. That was working fine until uh, sometime when the company had grown a bit, and we were having many more engineers, many more builds every day, and Docker machine was starting to hit limits. Uh, we were hitting API rate limits with the AWS API, and it was starting to be tricky to, to, to scale with uh, the scale of the company. And so we migrated our workers to Kubernetes, right? This was uh, easy because at that time we had enough of knowledge uh, of Kubernetes at Datadog to be able to, to do that. And it was pretty successful. But as you can see, to build Docker images, we were still using the dedicated runners. The, the next step in, in this journey is some customer were starting to ask us for ARM binaries, right? Because we provide the Datadog agent, for instance, that people use for monitoring, and people were starting to use ARM CPUs, so we need to provide them with ARM binaries. And so what we did is, because we're running on Kubernetes, we set up Kubernetes nodes with ARM CPUs, and we're running builds uh, on, on, this, on this node to get native builds. Well, as you can imagine, the next step, well, of course, to be able to do that, we need to have Docker images that supported ARM architecture. And so we wanted to have multi-arch images. To do this, uh, we transition our runners from running simple Docker builds to running Docker BuildX, which allows you to do multi-arch builds by relying on emulation with QMU. So it was, to be honest, this was magic. It just worked, right? Um, we were able to provide to get images which were both working on x86 and ARM by using emulation. However, as you can imagine, for some builds, uh, we move from 10 minutes on native x86 to more than an hour on ARM emulated, right? So it wasn't ideal. And, and today, the talk is going to focus on this part, like how we build images and how we transition to, to Kubernetes. So as I was hinting, I mean, this system was starting to show its limit, uh, the way we're building Docker images. It was the last workload running outside of Kubernetes, which was starting to be a pain for the team managing it because everything else was managed with a single team, by a single team, doing everything on Kubernetes, and but this team had to manage dedicated instances outside of Kubernetes to, to, for these workloads. It, it also requires uh, investing in this legacy platform, right? Because we wanted to do multi-arch builds and native ARM builds um, we needed new runners, right, which was not something we wanted to invest in. And, and finally, as I said before, this way of building images 
raises a lot of concern in terms of security because your builds are basically root on the, on the machine they run on. This gets us to the main topic of the presentation today, which is, well, what if we could actually build images inside Kubernetes? This is very attractive, right? So if you look at how people do this, because many people have, have tried and tried to do it, you have multiple ways. The first one is to use Docker in Docker. So what you do is similar to what I was describing before, which is you create a Kubernetes pod in which you mount the Docker socket, and from there you do Docker builds. You can also use standalone builders, so builders dedicated to build images inside Kubernetes, and I gave a, I gave a few examples. And finally, you can use a dedicated build daemon, and this is what BuildKit is about. So can, can, we use, can we use this option? Uh, as, you can, uh, as I'm sure you've guessed, the first one was uh, a no-go from the start. There was no way we would give uh, build pods access to being root on the, on the Kubernetes node. The second one, standard builders, uh, actually worked pretty well in something we, um, we, we tried them and they work. But they were a bit more complex to use because you had, if you want to do multi-arch images, it means you have to distribute jobs. You need to run one job on x86 nodes, one job on ARM nodes, and one job to assemble the multi-arch image and push it to the registry. So it works, but it's more complex. BuildKit D, although the build daemon was very attractive to us because, well, the UX is great, right? You, you can use the same buildx command to build locally on your laptop, to build on a dedicated instance builder, and to build with remote builders uh, allowing native builds. So this is what we're going to focus on today. So what would this look like? like let's get back to our build infra running in, in Kubernetes. So, well, what we wanted to achieve is simply this, right? When, when a job is to build a new image, what, what we want to do is one of the workers is going to run the build, it's going to do a docker build, ex build command and contact a build kit da daemon and do the build. What is nice is because it's remote build and build kit support, build X supports it, we can actually have daemons running on x86 and daemons running on ARM nodes. And BuildX is able to build, uh, to, to use the remote builders to build the native image on an x86 node and a native image on an ARM node, assemble them and create the multi arch image. Of course, we wanted to make this safe. And as, as you know, the main challenge uh, with, with building images is most of the time it requires being very privileged, right? Because you have to install packages, for instance, which requires being root. But what we want to, to achieve is rootless builds, right? Because we don't want containers to run as root, because when you do this, if there's a container escape, you end up with workloads that can actually do things on the, on the host. So what do we mean by rootless builds? Well, it's built where the main daemon inside Kubernetes is running as non-root, right, as the normal user. However, as I was saying before, we also need to be root to run some commands. And this is where user namespace come, come into play. Right? A user namespace is a way to simulate a root user, but you're not root in, on the host. You're just root in this limited namespace with limited capability. And user namespace are very powerful, and they interact with many low-level kernel implementations, like capability, mounts, or security modules. If you're curious about how this works, there's this great presentation from Akihiro at KubeCon in 2019, where he explained exactly how this works. So to give you a very quick overview, this is how it looks like. Um, you have a build-kit worker. The PID1 is running as UID 1000, so a non-privileged user, so that's completely fine, exactly what we want. And then everything else is running on a user namespace. And the UID is zero, but I put a star because it's not really zero. It's zero inside this namespace, but it's not root uh, on the host. A very quick example, it's very easy to, to simulate if you want to try it on a Linux machine. This command will create a uh, user namespace, and in there you can see we root in the namespace, but we can't touch a file that requires being root on the host. So th that's why the touch etc slash x fails, because we just root in this namespace, we're not root on the host, so we can't do something that requires root permission on the host. And if we touch a file we can't, we can modify, you, we see that it belongs to root in the namespace, but if we exit the namespace, the file actually belongs to UID 1000, right? So this is how the magic works. So 
this is the, 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 the main intro, now we're going to dive into interesting and fun things. Um, to, be, to be fair, when we started working with build kits, everything mostly works, right? More than 80% of the builds just worked out, out of the box. But today we're going to focus on the 20% that were interesting. Because otherwise, where's the fun, right? So we're going to present to you like three different issues, and we're going to go into increasing complexity. So the first one uh, is, well, actually, simple enough. It took us only a few, a few hours to understand what was happening. So this issue started with this extremely complex Docker file, right? It's, we're just getting an image from a public registry and running echo test. What could go wrong? I mean, this feels like something that should work, right? Well, when we run this inside our uh, rootless build kit environment, here is what we got. So that was, of course, very surprising because this is like a, the most basic Docker file you can use. And something that's interesting is we've got an operation not permitted message, but it says something about mounts. So something might be happening with the file system. So that's pretty surprising. Let's look into it. So what we wanted to understand is what was happening. So what we did is we S-traced the build kit D daemon, and we started the build, and we looked for uh, permission errors, right? And this one is actually pretty interesting, right? We have this command that is trying to set an extended attribute, and it's actually a SC Linux attribute, and it's failing. And, well, I made the joke about it's always DNS because I tend to talk about networking issues, and to be fair, it's often DNS, but it's also quite often SC Linux. And the only thing I, need, I know how to do with SC Linux is how to disable it, I'm sorry. <laughs> So, I mean, we had a very good insight, a very good idea what might be happening. And, and so what we did is we downloaded the layers of the image, extracted the tarball, and looked at the content of the tarball. And as we suspected, there's actually SC Linux label, labels on the files, right? And it turns out, if you're root on a host user namespace, you can modify the security context of a file. This is what we do at the top of the slide. However, if you're in a user namespace, which is the second part of the slide, and we're entering the user namespace used by BuildKit D, we can't modify the SC Linux attribute of a file, right? And the kernel disallow it. You can't do it if you're in a user namespace, which makes sense. So this is uh, the issue. That we open an issue upstream. To be fair, there's no magic, nothing we can really do. But it's pretty easy to mitigate, right? Either you remove the SC Linux attributes by pulling and pushing the file, or you use an image without any SC Linux label, which, to be fair, is something I would recommend you do. And we were lucky enough because one was an upstream image, and the one just the release just after the one we were using actually didn't have the labels anymore. Let's move to issue number two. So this one, uh, as you're going to see, was slightly more complex and, and took us a few days to, to understand. So the Docker file is a bit more complex, uh, but once again, no rocket science, right? We're just downloading a dev file and we're trying to install it. And of course, as before, this works perfectly fine if you do Docker build. It works perfectly fine if you use build kit in root mode. However, when you use build kit in rootless mode, and you, and you do exactly this uh, for this specific app, the build times out. So because uh, we are very scientific, well, we retry it, right? And this time it failed again, but it failed in a very different way. It failed with an error saying, well, address already in use. That's very weird. So at that point, well, we're like, let's try and understand what's, happen, what's happening. So we tried again. Well, this time it was consistent at least. We're seeing the same error uh, address already in use. So it was very confusing to us. So what we did is said, well, let's try from scratch. Let's delete the build kit depod and try again. Well, this time the build times out. Okay, we're back to what we had at the beginning. Well, let's try again. This time it fails with the same thing. So at least it's consistent. We, we have a way of reproducing the failures in a way that is reproducible, but doesn't really make sense yet. So let's debug. Um, so we use this, uh, this, this way to debug, right? Or, which is pretty simple. We just added netstat 
at the beginning and at the end of the command to see what was happening. And when we start with a new build kit dpod, the first net stat shows no port bound, which is very expected. But the second one shows that the, the port is, is, is bound by, by the app daemon, and the build hangs. Okay, that's what, so maybe package installation is starting a daemon, right? It happens sometimes. Let's do the second build. When we do the second build, this time, netstat is showing that the port is bound, and package installation fails with address already in use. So we're getting somewhere, right? It looks like package installation is starting a daemon, and it looks like the daemon is still running when we do the second build, which makes little sense because it's a completely separate build. So can we reproduce this by using uh, a different method? So we use this very simple reproducer. So you have the Docker file on the top left of the slide and the script on the top right. So it's pretty simple. We just start from Ubuntu. We have the script. We run the script. And we echo the script is done. And as you can see here, everything works fine, except we never get to the last line of the Docker file because the build hangs. So exactly what we were saying before. So it's a good thing. We've reproduced. What seems to happen is, well, if we look into the container, uh, we actually see Sleep still running, which is what we were suspected before, right? Remember, some app was still running, and that's why the port was bound. So it seems that the process is leaked or, and, and never stopped. So let's, let's look exactly at what's happening under the hood. So this is the anatomy of the build kit worker. So we have the build kit daemon. When we start the build, builddex is going to do an exec in the pod. It's going to start the build steps. So here it's going to run bash. Bash is going to run sleep in the background. And what's important here, and we're going to come back to this later, is there's no process sandbox. We can see all the processes uh, in the container. So if you exec into this pod and run ps, we see our build step, but also we see build kit D, root test kit, we see, we see everything. And when, when bash exits, so bash is not there anymore, the build hangs, and the process is still there and never cleaned up. So at that point, we're like, well, we, we got curious, right? What, has, what happens if we actually kill sleep inside this uh, hanging uh, build, build pod? Well, we were able to kill it, but it was never garbage collected because it's, and it became a zombie, which was also kind of interesting to us. So at this moment, we took a step back. Um, how does it work usually? So build steps use, usually run in a process sandbox, and when the step finishes, uh, all the process inside the sandbox are killed. However, in rootless mode, we run build kit with this flag that is very clear. Like, this flag says, well, you don't get a process sandbox. And because we don't have a sandbox, we can't keep track of all the processes starting during the build, and we can't clean them, and we can really clean them up. So this got us to, but why do we need this flag? And the reason we need this flag is because of the way procfs work in containers. So when you create a container, you have your own procfs. But for security reasons, every runtime is, uh, every single runtime is not going to give you a full procfs. It's going to give you a limited procfs where some of the directory in Slack proc will be either masked, which means it's going to be an empty directory, or made read-only, so you, you can't modify things system-wide. Right. And, and that makes sense. That's for security reasons. We don't want to expose too much things to containers, and we don't want containers to modify things on the host. However, when you do this, so you're in a container, you have a proc which is partially masked for security reasons. If you want to create a new procfs, which is what we would need to do to create a sandbox for our build step. We actually can't because there's a kernel check that's called mount to revealing, which is verifying if you, the procfs you have access to is partially masked or not. And if it is partially masked, it won't let you create a new procfs. And that's why we actually need our worker to not try and, and, and create a sandbox for the processes. And that's why all the processes are seen inside the build kit process namespace. In, in conclusion, I mean, there's no real solution to date. We, we chatted about it with maintainers in this issue extensively, and there's no real way to do it. Uh, there are potentially multiple mitigations. The one we use, we're using for now is we're making sure 
that our Docker files are not starting daemons in the background, or if they do, we explicitly stop them, so that's easy enough. Something that could be interesting in the future is Kubernetes expose a notion that is called procman type, where you can tell that a specific container will have a procfs that is not masked, so fully accessible, which means if you remember that mount to revealing will be okay, and we will be able to create a new procfs for our build step inside the sandbox, inside the container, sorry. The, the, so that's extremely promising, but it's the, the feature has been in alpha in Kubernetes since 1.12, so we're not exactly sure if it's going to, uh, to BG at some point. We could also use jobs for builds where uh, we use um, where the build kit daemon would be used for a single build, which would, be, which would avoid this issue. Of course, I mean, there are some uh, security limitations because what I didn't see, uh, what I didn't show you before is if build kit D can be used to run multiple build steps at the same time. So inside the build kit D daemon, you can actually have processes for different build steps at the same time in the same process, uh, in the same set of processes. And of course, you, it could lead to processes, a build sync process from other builds. So not too big of an issue, but still not ideal. And this gets us to the last and, and third issue, which is the, the most complex one. Okay, yeah, so our last talk was uh, at KubeCon was Ghosts in the Runtime. Uh, we like Ghosts, so this time Ghosts in the File System. Um, so we're just gonna build a Go program. So here it's the local volume provisioner, uh, fairly straightforward. We clone the repository, check out a specific tag, and then run Go build. What could possibly go wrong? Well, we get a compilation error. Uh, consistent read, redeclared. Uh, it's clearly declared in two files here, read.go and consistent read.go. But the strange thing is, when you build this yourself on your laptop or in a Docker build, uh, not in rootless, it works perfectly fine. So what's happening? Let's have a look at the directory contents. Well, indeed, in this vendor directory, we have both files, consistent read and read. So the compilation error is normal at this point, but how did we get in this state? Because in the master branch, you just have read.go, and at the tag, we have just consistent read.go. So we clearly shouldn't have these two files at the same time. So we check at each layer. Um, the git clone shows that we have read.go. That's expected. The checkout at the tag shows that we have only consistent read.go, so that's fine too. But we've already seen that in the end, at the next step, we have both files for some reason. So something's wrong with the file system here. What's, what, what's going on? So we use overlayfs uh, as our snapshotter for, for builds. This is a fairly common uh, file system to be using in this situation. And the way overlayfs works is that it's what's known as a union file system. So the idea is you have a set of directories that are the, the base, and you want to expose a mount point where changes can be made, but without affecting the, the original files. And so what overlayfs does is it has an intermediate, or what we call the upper layer, which uh, records the changes that have occurred on the file system that's exposed to, to processes through the mount point. And so, for instance, uh, a file that's deleted will be marked in the uh, change layer, the upper layer, as a tombstone file. So that's a special character device file, major zero, minor zero. And that will serve to mask the file that's in the lower directories and, um, and so that it doesn't appear in the, in the mount point any longer if, if the file's been removed. Um, you also have, for instance, directories in the upper and lower layers combined so that uh, the, the mount point exposes the, the combination of the changes and the original files, depending on files that are masked, changed, whatever. So that's all very good. Let's try and reproduce the steps uh, of the of build kit here. So first we unshare the user namespace. That's uh, what build kit is doing. That's because we're running in rootless. We create some directories uh, to, to provision our overlay file system. Uh, so we have layer one, which is the, the lower layer, where we're going to do the git clone. Then we have a, uh, the layer two, which will be our mount point that we will expose. And we have the layer two diff, which is going to be the changes that occur uh, through the overlay file system. And so for in particular, when we actually do the git checkout after mounting the file system, the L2 diff directory is going to record the changes that are made. So that's all very good. 
we look at what we end up with in each of the directories, and we see, so layer one, the checkout, we have read.go, fine. Layer two difference, we have consistent read.go, that's expected, that's the new file, and in the mount point that's exposed, we see only consistent read.go, that's consistent with what we've seen before, but it's, uh, we haven't reproduced the problem at this point. So now let's pile on the step three of our build. Uh, where we list the directory contents, because it's the equivalent of when we build and we get the compiler error. So we unpound the previous overlay file system, we provision some new directories for the, uh, the difference layer for, for our step three, the layer three directory, which will be the mount point that we expose, and we mount this. So one thing to note here is that in the lower directories, we actually have two directories, because we have first the changes that were made by the git checkout, and then we have the base, which is the git clone. Um, and we list the, the files, and we've reproduced the problem. We, we see both files, so clearly there's something wrong here. So if we step, take a step back and look at what we've done. So we have a layer one where we do the git clone, we then have an overlay FS where we do the git checkout, and so we see that uh, in the difference layer, we have consistent read.go and it's ex exposed through the mount point. We've then piled on step three. Uh, so we have an extra difference layer, which is not too important here. And we have the mount point, which is exposed, which shows both files, which is our problem. So at this point, we begin to suspect that the problem is somewhere in the layer two difference directory. Something's going on here. And indeed, one thing to note, I mentioned earlier tombstone files. We've removed the read.go file, and yet we have no tombstone file in the listings. So where is it? Well, maybe we've missed something. And yes, we have. So in overlayFS, there's actually an optimization. Uh, for directories which are where all the contents have been deleted, and, but the directory still exists, you have an opaque flag. Basically, it avoids overlayFS from having to recurse in, in under layer directories if all the contents have been suppressed. It's, it's an optimization. But how does it work? So, basically, in our case, there's uh, the opacity, the, the opaque flag has been set on the layer two diff directory, and that is why we're not seeing read.go any longer in the layer two uh, mount point. But how does it actually work? So what's done is that overlayFS sets an extended attribute called trusted overlay opaque on the directory that it wants to mask, or it wants to mask the lower layers. So can we see this, uh, this extended attribute? So we do the operation in the username space, get file attributes, and we've got nothing. So that's interesting because how come in step two then, read.go is ending up being masked? If we can't see the extended attribute, it shouldn't work. Now if we rerun the same command but in the host username space, the initial username space, we do see the extended attribute. So it is being set. But that also is a bit strange because Trusted, the trusted namespace of extended attributes is actually subject to uh, permissions. You can only set ex trusted extended attributes if you are Capsys admin, you have the, the system administrator capability in the host user namespace, which is not the case in our overlayFS uh, sequence here in rootless. So we shouldn't be able to set that extended attribute, and yet we have. So we have a bunch of mysteries. How come trusted overlay opaque is being set, because we shouldn't have the permissions to do so. And when the directory that is flagged as opaque is uh, mounted as an uh, upper directory, the problem doesn't reproduce. But when it's a lower directory, it does reproduce. So at this point, we resort to kernel function tracing. We rerun the git checkout step with kernel function tracing, and we look for the operation where the extended attribute is set. And there we realize that a function that's being called is VFS set extended attributes no perm. And this makes us suspect that, well, the credential checks are actually being bypassed in this scenario for some reason, which we don't quite understand. Uh, 
So looking at the source code and uh, the, the, the git commits, we realized that um, on the kernel that we're using, an Ubuntu kernel, there was some work done to make uh, overlay file systems work in user namespaces. And the change that was made was that, indeed, the uh, credentials check on setting extended attributes for trusted uh, opaque overlay and uh, for removing them were bypassed. So you don't have a credential check. But it's also interesting to note that there was no change made for the get. So we still don't quite understand certain things. We do understand that we're having the attribute set, um, but we can't read it. So that's why in step three, we see both files, because we can't read the extended attribute, so the opacity is not being honored. Fine. But in step two, why don't we have the same problem? Because we can't read that extended attribute either. And it turns out that, well, if we think about it, file systems do a lot of caching. So maybe if we drop the caches, we'll see something different. So again, we reproduce our case. We reach the point, this is step two. We reach the point where we list the files and we see consistent read.go only. So opacity somehow is being, respect, is being honored, even though we don't expect it to be. We now drop the caches, and lo and behold, the two files are there. So in fact, what's happening is that in addition to the extended attributes, there's an opacity flag that's being set on the directory entries in the file cache. And that, so long as that, um, the D entry is in memory, and the file doesn't, the directory doesn't need to be reread from disk, we're able to honor the opacity. So in short, um, the kernel we're using added a patch to make user F, uh, overlay FS work inside user namespaces, but it was a partial change. It only changed the set and the remove of the extended attribute. And thanks to caching, well, sometimes the opacity is honored and sometimes it isn't, which leads to some rather interesting behaviors. Now, the nice thing is that actually in uh, kernel 5.11, a new option was introduced to overlay FS mount options called user xatch. And what this does is it changes the namespace that's used for the opacity and other overlay FS um, extended attributes. And it makes it possible for any user to, be, to set the extended attributes simply because they're not any longer in the trusted namespace. The other nice thing is that BuildKit actually, uh, the overlay implementation adds user xapt support when it's available. And so all we had to do was wait for kernel 5.11 to be available for our uh, distribution for Ubuntu and uh, then simply roll it out to our nodes, renew our nodes. And from that point, it just worked. So. At this point, we've solved, I think, pretty much all our problems with building images, and so we have some pretty good results. Um, as Laurent said, we, you know, right from the, the get-go, we had something like 80% of the images were actually building fine with BuildKit in rootless mode, and really, it was just a matter of getting past the last few hurdles. Um, starting with a monorepo for building images, dedicated to building images, was clearly very helpful here because it really, you know, sifted through all the problems. Uh, very fast. Um, so it allowed us to decommission our dedicated Docker runners, uh, giving us, you know, easier node lifecycle management. Uh, the, the developer experience team no longer needed to manage a dedicated set of Docker runners and things like that. And it helped us get native multi-arc builds uh, because, well, yeah, emulation is way too slow. So currently we have several hundred distinct images that are being built on Cube. Um, all, I mean, all our images are now built on Cube anyway. And so this system is now handling more than a thousand builds a day, perfectly reliably, and uh, we're, we're really happy with it. Um, so our messages are that BuildKit, you know, is really good. We, we've had a very good experience with it. Um, it gives us remote builds. It gives us multi-arc images really easily. Um, rootless is or was a little bit bleeding edge, um, but you know, with the changes in kernel 5.11, overlay FS in user namespaces has become really uh, very usable. Well, it works fine. Um, I think really the only problem we still have slightly, that, you know, that could affect us uh, is the process sandboxing. And so I think at some point we'll have to check out uh, the proc mount unmasked uh, option that Laurent mentioned. And that's it. <laughs>
थैंक यू